My name is Nick Price. I'm the senior pastor here at Trinity. We are one church in multiple locations that shares a common mission, which is helping people look, live, and love more like Jesus. And we are in the middle of a series that we are calling Life in Light of Eternity, looking at Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. And so I want to encourage you, if you have your scripture journal, go ahead and pull that out so you can follow along. If you don't have one of these yet, you can still pick these up out in the lobby. This is your way that you can kind of take notes and study along with us as we move through this letter. And uh, I want to say before we dive into God's word, it's always right to allow him to prepare our hearts and our minds for the message he has for us. So would you please bow your heads and pray together with me? Lord God, we give you thanks that this morning you have indeed gathered us together in your presence that we might learn from you, that we might learn what it means to live life in light of eternity, in light of the incredible gift and promise of salvation that you've given us that not only promises us a future, but helps us to understand what it means to live well today. And so, Lord, we pray that you would remove anything that would keep us from hearing your word, that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive your message. And, Lord, I pray that the words of my lips and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, O God, who is indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So over my years of ministry, one of the things that I have found is that I've talked to many men and women who've left different churches. They're either coming to Trinity because they're leaving some other church, or maybe they're leaving Trinity to go to some other place. And one of the things that I've found over and over again is that very rarely do people leave churches for theological reasons. Very rarely do they say, oh, it's my church has kind of departed from the teaching of God's word, and that's why I'm out of here. Oftentimes, people leave for one of two other reasons. Either it's because the church is no longer meeting their personal preferences, and they're like, I just don't like that anymore. Or, and these are the most heartbreaking of circumstances, it's because there was some sort of conflict or division. Some sort of conflict or division that had divided the church and had alienated them from one another, whether it was interpersonal conflict or political or racial or socioeconomic. These are the things that often lead people to walk away from the faith. And in fact, one of the things that I often hear from non-churchgoers as a criticism of the church is they say, you know, while you guys speak about God's love and God's grace, what I see when I look at the church is that you are just as divided as the rest of the world. And that though we might confess to believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, when, often when the world looks at us, it sees very little oneness and even less holiness. It really poses a question for us of, of what does it mean to truly be united? Why does Christian unity matter? And this is important to note because that's exactly what Paul is going to be talking about in our passage for this morning as we look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. Specifically, we learn three things about Christian unity. First, we learn the barriers to it. Second, the source of it. And lastly, the purpose for it. We learn the barriers to unity, the source of unity, and the purpose for unity. So let's go ahead and let's take a closer look at what God has to say uh, to us from his word. One of the things that, that Paul first notes is the barriers to unity. He speaks about this dividing wall of hostility which separated Jewish people from Gentiles. Or to maybe update the Gentile term for our modern context from the nations, from the wider world. There's this dividing wall of hostility that existed between these two groups of people. Now, this this may seem strange to us now living in 21st century America, which is why I think it's important to dive back in and really understand the the, the original issues and, and the problems that existed between Jews and Gentiles. One of the things that we don't really understand is back in the first century, there was an, an incredible amount of animosity between these groups of people. In fact, New Testament scholar William Barclay notes the the following about Jewish attitudes towards Gentiles in the first century. He said, the Gentiles said the Jews were created by God to be fuel for the fires of hell. God, they said, loves only Israel of all the nations he had made. Until Christ came, the Gentiles were an object of contempt to the Jews, and the barrier between them was absolute. If a Jewish boy married a Gentile girl or if a Jewish girl married a Gentile boy, the funeral of that Jewish boy or girl was carried out. Such contact with a Gentile was equivalent of death. 
But this hostility went both ways. Because the Gentiles themselves also had a very strong prejudice and bias against the Jewish people. Uh, Tacitus, an, an early historian in the Roman world, said this, The Jews are a race that hates the gods and mankind. Likewise, um, Juvenal, uh, a Roman poet, said this. He's taught, speaking about the Jews. He said, They make a mockery of other people's gods, and for that reason alone, they deserve to be punished. Now, looking at these quotes, we, we rightly recoil against that kind of prejudice in whatever form we encounter it. There's no room and there's no space in God's people for this kind of prejudice between groups of people. But what Paul says is he says this is heartbreaking for another reason. Not only is the prejudice itself a problem, but the, what it results in is also a tragedy, especially when you consider it from God's perspective. And specifically, this is what Paul notes. If you take a closer look at verse 12, he actually notes three things. He says the result of this hostility is this, is that the Gentiles are separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. He says this is a tragedy for another reason, because now the nations are separated from Christ, alienated from the people of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, and now having no hope and without God in the world. See, what Paul is saying is he's saying the Jewish people, the people of Israel, had a purpose and a calling. It was a purpose and a calling to actually be God's ambassadors to the nations. And because of this hostility that now exists between our people, that message is no longer going forward. It's no longer going out. People aren't hearing about the God of blessing because of the prejudice and animosity that exists. In fact, the New Testament scholar John Stott puts it this way. He says, we need to remember that in calling Abraham, God promised through his posterity to bless all the earth's families. And that in choosing Israel, he intended her to become a light to the nations. The tragedy is that Israel forgot her vocation, twisted her privilege into favoritism, and ended by heartily despising, even detesting, the heathen dogs. See, what he says is he says, the reason this is so heartbreaking is not only does it diminish the image of God that we find in other people, but it prevents the message of God going out to those who most desperately need to hear it. That's the tragedy. And this is worth us meditating on as a people because the reality is, is that today division and animosity among God's people still does far more damage to the purposes of God than any other issue. Far too often, we allow our prejudices, our biases, and our desires to dominate what we believe the church should be about. And the wider world is watching. I love how Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it in his book, Life Together, talking about this temptation that we often fall into. He says this, he says, those who love their dream of a Christian community more than the Christian community itself become destroyers of that community, even though their personal intentions may be ever so honest, earnest, and sacrificial. Those who dream of this idealized community demand that it be fulfilled by God, by others, and by themselves. Whatever does not go their way, they call a failure. When their idealized image is shattered, they see the community breaking into pieces, so they first become accusers of other Christians in the community, then accusers of God, and finally, the desperate accusers of themselves. He says, too often we want to make the church in our own image. We have this vision of what the church should be so that it serves me and meets my needs. And he says, and when we do that, when we approach the church in that way, we ultimately destroy the community that God has brought together. Too long, the reason why the mission of God is hindered in the wider world is because we've allowed our self-centered and self-righteous demands to dictate what God's people should be like. We demand that the church endorses our political aspirations or nationalist ambitions, affirms our prejudices, and blesses our selfish and our materialistic comforts. 
And all the while, the wider world looks at us and rightly labels us hypocrites. This is the greatest barrier to Christian unity. It's when we bring our own self-righteous and self-serving expectations to the community of God and so divide it on the basis of our own desires. That's the barrier to unity that we struggle with. That's what Paul is highlighting here. He says this hostility between these groups of people is damaging the mission. It's preventing people from hearing the good news. So we have to say, so what's the solution? How, how do we get back? Well, I think the way we get back is by going back to the source of Christian unity. Here's what Paul says about the source of Christian unity. What's beautiful to note as you follow these verses is there's this movement in this text from alienation and hostility to unity and peace. There's a movement from, from being strangers to becoming family. Four times, actually, in this passage, Paul uses the word peace to describe this new relationship that exists between the people of Israel and the Gentiles. He talks about how, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. Later on in verse 17, and he came and he preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. Peace to the Gentiles and peace to the people of Israel. There's this beautiful movement that takes place in this text in which he's saying, Peace has now been created and it's given to us as a gift through whom? Through Jesus. He says Jesus is our peace. How is that possible? Well, first by remembering why Jesus came. Perhaps one of the most famous Bible passages in the wider Western world, even among uh, those who aren't churchgoers, is John 3.16, right? Right? Whenever you're watching, you know, football on television, it's always there at the end zone. Somebody's got John 3.16, like on a giant placard. And don't, have the, don't actually have the text of the passage, just the reference. But what does it say? It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God so loved the world, the nations, all people. This is why Paul says, he himself is our peace. He's broken down this dividing wall of hostility. Why? He's, because he's brought us near through the blood of Jesus. And when we look at the life and the ministry of Jesus, what we see is we see him constantly extending his grace and his mercy and his love and his compassion to whomever he meets whether they're an Israelite or a Samaritan or a Gentile, every time Jesus encounters somebody, he approaches them with this incredible love and this incredible grace. And he welcomes them in. And what's interesting to note is how he accomplishes that. Paul says he does it by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. What he says is he says, the laws that the people of Israel could not keep and that the Gentiles didn't know have now been fulfilled on our behalf. He says inclusion in the family of God is no longer merited by our works nor determined by our pedigree. This family of faith isn't one that you are born into because of your family of origin, but one that you are adopted into through the grace of God. And your standing in God's eyes isn't dependent on how many rules you keep or commandments you follow, but is simply an expression of his grace, graciously given as the one who has reconciled us both to God. He says your peace and your unity is a gift. And everything else that you do together as God's people is meant to be built on that foundation, on that cornerstone. 
He actually says this. He says, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone. I love that he uses that language, the cornerstone. He says that our churches, when they are built on Jesus, can truly become places where all boasting and human pride are set aside. Where grace and mercy and compassion and humility and love are the marks of our community. That's what it means for Christ to be our cornerstone. It's to actually ask ourselves, how is how I'm living with my fellow Christians and my neighbors reflective of Jesus and of his character? Is how I'm living in my relationship to my fellow Christians and to my neighbors reflective of Jesus and his character? He says, that is the controlling question because Christ is our cornerstone. When we speak to each other or about each other, is Christ glorified? When we have conflicts and we need to work through our issues, is Jesus Christ held up as first and foremost a peacemaker? And is that our pursuit as well? Paul says Jesus is the source of our unity because in him we realize that we are all covered by grace and mercy. By love and peace. And that is what is supposed to dictate and guide every single one of our interactions with each other. Christ, the cornerstone the one upon whom the entire family rests, upon whom the entire community is built. And what's amazing about that is that then gets us to the purpose for Christian unity. Because he goes on and he says this, you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. He says, ultimately, this community is meant to become a temple. Now, again, we're, we're kind of like separated from that, you know, ancient context. So let me unpack why that, that imagery of, of being a temple is so important. You see, a temple in the ancient world was a dwelling place for the gods. It's where the presence of the gods rested in the midst of the community. So that if you wanted to encounter the gods and to be in their presence and encounter the, the divine, you would go to a temple. And in fact, in the Old Testament, that's exactly what we see, is this desire of God to dwell in the midst of his community. That upon rescuing them from slavery in Egypt, the first thing he says, he says, now I would like you to build me a tent too, so that I can dwell in your midst. And likewise, later on, when they get to Jerusalem, that temple is moved there to the city of Jerusalem. Uh, That tent is moved there. Eventually, it's constructed to be a temple because the temple was the place where you encountered God's presence. But here's what's so amazing about what Paul is saying here. He says, but now, no longer do you go to a physical building to encounter the presence of God. Where you find God is in a community of people. That's where God's presence is found. That it's not a building, but rather a people group, a community where others will now encounter Jesus. He says, in short, the church as God's family is how people are going to meet Christ. And I love this because what he's highlighting there is he's saying, this is who our God is. He's a relational God. And the way that you encounter him is not just by talking about him or going to some physical space, it's best encountered in actual relationships, in the context of community. His love is best experienced rather than just talked about. He says this reconciliation and the forgiveness and the love of God, it shines most brightly when it's lived out and it's embodied in a community that bears his name, that reflects Jesus. Jesus. 
It's best experienced in the context of a family who themselves live in light of God's grace. He says that's a powerful testimony to the world, a world that is so divided, often divided along the lines of race or nationality or socioeconomic status or any of the other social markers that we create in our world to distinguish us versus them. He says in God's family, though, all of those are broken down. And the way that people truly see that we have a God who loves everyone is when they encounter a community where everyone is loved. So central was this that Jesus himself said it on the night that he was betrayed to his disciples. He says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. To meet God isn't to travel to a temple or to a place, but rather to be a part of a community and become a part of a family. This is how the world truly knows who Jesus is. That's the purpose for our unity. The source is Jesus and his grace. The purpose is mission. So that the wider world might experience the blessings of God embodied in the family. This is part of the reason, by the way, so not just a plug for us, but seriously, this is the reason why our mission statement is we want to help people look, live, and love more like Jesus. <laughs> it's because we understand that Jesus alone is the cornerstone. And it's because our desire is that everybody would experience God's grace, but that starts in the context of this family. <laughs> now, later on, <laughs> In the letter to the church at Ephesus, Paul is going to get into all the practicals about this. Starting in chapter 4 all the way through chapter 6, he's going to say, so practically what does that look like? How do you do this? What does that mean for our actual daily lived-in relationships? But he says, but you have to understand the cornerstone first. Before we get into what you have to do and what it looks like to live in light of that, you need to understand the one in whose light you live. The one who has now made you family. He says, I want to remind you of this so that you don't forget it. And secondly, I want to pray that this would be true in greater and greater measure that we might increasingly live into it. Which is why I think Paul actually ends the first half of the book of Ephesians with a prayer a prayer for the church that we would know whose we are and who we are. And that's exactly how I'd like to end the message for this morning. I want you to hear the words of Paul that he prays not just for the people of Ephesus, but for you. Let's pray. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Lord Jesus that was Paul's prayer for us. That's the prayer that we pray now. That you would help us to not only know the height and depth, and length, and breadth of your love, but that it would flow through us to all the families of the earth. Forgive us, Lord, for the ways in which we've forgotten that. Ways in which we've made the church about us, not about you. Made belonging in this place more about us than about you and your grace. 
and help us in increasing measure to remember that you are our cornerstone. You are our peace. You are our Lord and our Savior and the one who calls us family. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. I want to invite you to join with me as we confess our faith. We're going to do so using the words of the Nicene Creed. That's going to be up on the screen here in just a moment. Because when we confess our faith together, it reminds us of who our God is, what he's done for us, and how we live in light of that. So would you please stand and let's speak these words together. Words Christians have been saying down through the centuries. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. 